Go, I suppose my first experience has to be with my brother coming to school in De La Salle, Stephen. He was four years old, two years older than I. And he'd meet the apple man on Ballybricken. And he'd say, Steve, Tommy, hide me books, I'm going off an apple man. Get the biggest apple on the, and drop it on the ground for me. I'd hide his books and go off to school in De La Salle. And in fact, across the road we had where you were yesterday, it was a Protestant hall. We were never allowed to go across in, inside the gate of that, that premise. Or, or during our school days, like for example. But Stephen would go off anyway, delivering apples all over the town. And I'd end up in school. The following day, he'd go off with a, a lady called Kate Allen's shop and go for milk out at Mount Congrove. And still hide his books. Never went to school. My brother Stephen. But as we grew up anyway, I ended up in a place called Brazzles, a vegetable shop, delivering apples and what have you, all over the place. But the first job I got was going to Mount Congrove, of all places, for flowers, to make wreaths for funerals for Mr. Brazil. And he in turn anyway, I worked there for all, nearly two years. In the middle of it all, I got a job in Kennedy's on the Mall, chemist. Three or four shillings more than Brazil would pay me. So I went back and said to him, I'm leaving now, I'm going to work for Mr. Kennedy. He said, How much is he going to pay you? 14 shillings. I'll give you 14 shillings. So he gave me the 14 shillings to stay with him, which I did. I spent two years there, delivering all around Newtown, potatoes, cabbage, you name it, to all the big houses in Newtown. I ended up by about 14 years of age anyway, 15 years of age left and went to work for Paddy Quinlan. And then went to work for Sages, the O'Connell Street, the furniture factory, the place that used to make the furniture in O'Connell Street. Then I went on to the docks. And the docks was a tough job, to my mind anyway. Filling coal with a big shovel, as big as that thing there. Unbelievable. Black, I didn't know what the, I was black, what? Dirty. A job I didn't like, I didn't tell you. We ended up anyway, we'd be on the ships. There was one gang, a number one gang and number two gang. My father was on one of the gangs. And they'd be employed for the first ship in the harbour. Second ship, the second gang. But the third ship would come up, we'd get a job on our, the warehouse gang. That's where we were, all the younger lads. My brother and a few more of us. And Martin Collin was a stevedore that time. He'd employ us first, because he always knew the ship would be emptied very quickly. The tradition at that time was the captain of the ship, when the ship was emptied, he'd have a bottle of whiskey, whatever, three stops. And all the people who walked on the ship drank the toast to the captain before he left. The ship left then on the next tide always, whatever tide it was that they got. They ended up going away. And often we ask the question, for example, where did the sailors like to go, you know, Cork or Dublin or Galway? We hated Waterford. We said, why? We never got to know when I stay in Waterford. As soon as we came in, we were unloaded and we were gone again. We were the most efficient ship unloading in the whole country, bound on. And we lost that along the way, I don't know why. But it was hard work, actually, that time. When the ship would be working, we might not get a job. We would also get a job on the lorries, bringing the stuff to the stores. For example, salt. The salt was a 16-stone bag. Two lorries would come there from the Manali family. We'd all get a job on the lorries, carrying that salt into the stores in O'Connell Street. The bags were, as I said, two, 200 weight. We'd have to carry them into the store and drop them on the ground five high. But come dinner time, there'd be a ramp put up on the five bags. You've got five more. In other words, the, the whole load of salt off the ship had to be condensed on a, an area, we we'll say, of 20 square feet from Fanny's store. That's all the ground you were allowed. We'd also deliver some more into hills or currency. Then the next day we'd be on a cement board, for example. Paddles in O'Connell Street. 
Morris's graves is, would all be getting cement from the ship, all above the above the river. Also, we we load wagons of of, of uh, cement, 20 ton. Load a wagon, lift the brake on it, push it off onto a turntable, turn on the turntable, and push it off, ready for to be shipped off up all up the country. That's cement boats, but hard work, thirsty work. You would, I didn't know what the word thirst was. We go into the pub, for example, a bottle of cider, drink the cider without even taking it from your head. I wouldn't know you drank it, actually. So it's very, very hard work. I didn't like it too much. I eventually, after three years, I think it was, I ended up packing up with off over the clove I got a job. And I never looked back from clove. Have you ever seen but the different parts? The well, the dog, from, from, from the dock point of view, from the clock tower up, it was all tonnage work. Every ship come in there was a tonnage. And the ship was divided, we say, for 300 tonnes, divided by the amount of men on board ship. There'd be 22 men board our ship. The, the cargo would be divided by 22. And that's what you got out of the ship. Wages. But from that, this down, it was daily. 31 shillings a day was the money. And down the lower end of the wharf here, we had graves. Carry timber. Often carry timber down there, wet days, fine days, all the same. And the planks, they were called dales actually. Be nine to, be 18 foot long, nine by three on your shoulder. You'd have a pad on your shoulder, and to be, after the day to be cut into your shoulder. There were some great old dockers there, old lad, one fellow was called O'Reilly. He'd be related to you. I think. I wouldn't think he was less to you. I used to say one time, Christ our Lord only carried the cross once, he said. I'm carrying this every day, he said. <laughs> but, you know, planks, 18 foot long, wet and fine. They also had a big crane there as well. We used to take off so much of that stuff and drop it beside, save us all the carrying, like, for example, you know. But it was a hard job, 31 shillings a day. We go to a pub called the Three, the Three Ships Now. It was called O'Shea's for a bottle of Guinness. And the boys used to all, I never drank the Guinness. They used to all drink the Guinness. My God, after a day's work there, you know you were after walking. There were different times, I would think. Now, the far side of the river, now, the far side of the river we had, all the ships come in there with wheat. There were the Irish pine, the Irish oak, the Irish elm, the Irish birch, the Irish larch. There was five, I think, Irish ships. We'd be jobbed to go in the ship down the hatch and bushel the wheat to the, the suck, the vacuum. She'd take the whole cargo then up to the top of that store. And hard would imply us, when the ship would go away then, hard would imply us to go up on that top floor and they'd open a, a, Trap door, and we bushel all the wheat, and it all it was actually gravity fed all the way down to the lower places to be to be crushed to make it to flour. That was a hard job as well, 31 bob a day or something. But it was complete hardship. But it was good money at the time, I think, because at the time I didn't drink at all compared to my brother who would have a pint like at all. I'd buy suits, bought a lot of clothes actually. And that's when, the, when I had all the clothes, I left the docks, went over to Clover. Went to work with a, 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 a first, an uncle of yours, Matty Hennessy, in Clover. I spent 33 years in Clover, until I closed, 1983. That was my experience of work. When Clover closed, then I ended up a taxi man. What about further up the river then? Is there any water? Well, no, we were over there, for example, on that wharf over there. And that time the ships used to work with the ship's crane. In other words, those steam driven cranes. And you'd hear them coming, you'd hear them going. But there'd also be two men extra on the ship, what they call guy ropes, a man pulling the jib. You'd have to pull the jib in over the ship or back out onto the lorry. 
loading. When that's when the, the cranes came, all our work was done away with. There was no guy men or no men bearing off the car. Do you understand me? So she came there anyway, them three cranes. A brother of mine said to me one day, our job was never to stand under the under the, the bucket. You always stand back of the bucket. You drop the bucket. You'd place the bucket in position, whatever it would be. And the ship was, we'd say, divided into two or three hatches, what they call bulkheads. The cargo was always held in a way that if the ship was swaying, the cargo wouldn't move with it. The bulkheads bulk, bulk would stop it from ship, shifting. And we was, the more bulkheads more bulk in the ship, the better. So we would have to push them, shovel them. When the fellow was speaking about the ceiling, the ceiling was the bottom of the ship. You buckled it into the, into the buckets. And then slug it away. My brother used to say to me, watch out for that crane, the new crane. You wouldn't hear it coming. It was silent. It'd just be over your head. You never heard it coming, like, you know. The difference in the times. And, and was it dangerous like, to work in the boat? Not dangerous, no, but you had to always be stand back from under the, the crane when she was working. No matter where you were, you had to stand back when, when she was being low, dropped onto the, onto the floor, on the ceiling of the ship. The ceiling was the, to the floor. You always had to stand back so as to let it be, get its place, and then push it into wherever you wanted it. Because it was a hair ton or a ton bucket, and it was heavy. But the only way you had it sleeve was when it was on the, on the crane. And he, he lobbed and fired in, in position. But it was hard work. To my mind, it was tough work anyway. And tell us about some of the characters that worked on the crane. Well, now there was quite a few. For example, in my mind, there was one particular man called Mikey O'Shea. He was this size. He was about 20 stone weight, I'd say. And he could only go aboard ship in a bucket and drop him down. Then you had another fellow, famous uh, person on the car, dogs called Kel Cullen. He liked the, the, pot, no, the bottle of Guinness. He was related to the Cullen family who were the stevedores at the time. But the Cullens used to were the stevedores on the ship. In other words, they had the contract of unloading that ship and getting her away. And there was two stevedores, the Cullens and the Crokes. The Crokes were in the Royal Bry Bar, just up here on the quay. They were a separate family altogether. And they used to have a contract with different companies, like, you know. Like, there were so many different companies, coal companies, cement companies, potash. Then along, in, during the middle of all that, then along, along comes a man called Mr. Mulcahy. The potash boats. And he introduced the grabs into the docks. Now he in turn brought dockers from the docks here over to London to see it being walked in the, in, the, in, the, in the docks in London. The crane with a, with a grab. The grab would go down, take it up, men finished. And all the dockers were more or less, you know, obsolete then. The grabs took over the work. And it caused a bit of friction, I suppose, on the docks at the time because of all that carry on. And in turn, I suppose, the docks died, literally, because of all that event, I'd imagine. I remember you were saying that there was the Rob Rye. The Rob Rye Bar, yes. Did, did, did um, like, with the stevedores, were they based in the pubs? The stevedores owned the pub. Okay. Croaks owned the Rob Rye Bar. When in contrast, the Cullens didn't own any of the pubs up the way. They were just paid in the pub, as it happens, you know. Oh, paid in the pub, more or less, more or less. Now, the Bridge Hotel, was above that altogether. But that time the pubs could stay open nearly 24 hours a day. They used to be open to facilitate the docks. Drink in the morning, for example, now. Well, afterwards, that all changed, like, you know? There was only the pubs would be open for, to facilitate the docks and dockers. And people, well, just the tourists as well, probably. And what about the, uh, the way Warford always had the famous was, there's always talk about ladies of the night. Well, now we had, at that time, you could believe or believe it or not, I had a lot of innocence that time. We had a pub up, the, up there beside the Savoy, 
what was called, who was there was the telecom man were in it eventually. And there was a great say at that time, you get a bottle downstairs and you get a change upstairs. That's the first I ever knew or heard tell that there was such a thing as a red light or whatever in existence. Never knew of it at all. In fact, we were completely innocent of all that time. Thanks be to God. Like, that side of life we never saw at all. Only walk, eat our dinner, go to bed and walk. That was our life, our total our life. We were never good time boys out like that. Like, you know. We ended up, of course, in the Olympia. As you well know, it was our way of life, the Olympia. I spent all, every day, every night in the Olympia. Every night. But it was the Olympia, it was in the, another dance hall over the airway, Burton's at the time. There was a dance hall up there. It was also on the Tierra Royal upstairs as well. And one out in Ballon Dodd. And of course, the Atlantic and Tremor. Two dances every Sunday. An early one and a late one. And it's the dance at that time, we used to have a fellow called Joe Loss who came here to Waterford. Ten bob. We couldn't afford it. Just didn't go. But we went to the other bands, like the Comerfords, for example. They were an institution in Waterford. All the dances we went to with them. I spent all my time in the Rue Glen. Jimmy Atkins played the accordion. And we danced there all night long. Are you a good dancer? Me? Fair enough, I suppose. I danced as well. I'd have a dance anyway. And I could I probably still dance, I'd, I'd imagine. I, I would imagine. And did you meet your wife at the Olympia? Oh, I did. Uh, well, I met her actually in the carnival up in Ballybicken, where ye are now in the Ballybicken, in, in uh, yes. Barrick Street. I met her there, actually. And I was quite a young, what would I be? 20, 21. Very impressive age I, I, at the time, I'm sure. And Marion actually celebrated our celebration 60 years married a month ago. I wasn't there. I was in Arkeen. Had an operation. Shut out. But tell us about when you met. We met that time. I used to go to the pictures, of course. That was all the go to Savai, the Carl, the Town Hall, the Regal, four cinemas. We used to go to the cinema, every, every film ever won, I saw them all. Loved the music in the films. I could hum any tune that came on, came on the, on the radio, around in the, in, the, in the cinema. They used to have music as well that time, before the films. A band or instrumentalists playing before the films. Great novelty altogether, at the time. But the films were all the go that time. We spent all our time cinemas and dance hall. That was all my time. I love I love life and dancing. Loved it. And then as time went on then, I spent a lot of time in Southern Clover. Had a reasonably good job over there on shift work actually. I'd be on the road every morning, passing down here at half past six. Sorry, half past five. Go to Clover. I'd be in Clover at six o'clock, start up everything, the whole place, all the machinery, light all the fires, boilers and everything, and everything ready for eight o'clock. When people come in at eight o'clock, then the place was ticking over. I was one of the people that helped to have it ticking over. And you were saying that when you started in Clover, you used to be going, you used to have to shove it forward into the boilers. Oh, oh, oh yes, oh God, I had a boiler there, and she was from here as far as that hut there. It was about 40 foot long. You shove in a big rake and pull out the clinker out into a wheelbarrow. Wheel it out in the yard, come back in and put in more fresh coal. Put a blower on then blow away. All the time, constantly, all day long. We had oil as well, supplementing the coal. But along the way then, along came a fellow from England and converted the whole thing to oil. All oil, the whole place. So that changed the whole complexion of the whole job. It was all push button then from that on. And of course in Clover at the time, we had our own reservoir over there. Our reservoir would hold 300,000 gallons of water. That's a third of a million gallons of water for the supply of that factory. 
used to kill 400 cattle a day over there. Is that just for washing out stuff? For washing as well as use, domestic use. There was, there was a separate section for domestic use, another section for wash, washing floors and all that type of thing. We pumped all, we got all that water in our own land over in Clover. Deep wells, 150 feet down. With all our own well, all our own pumps, pumping the water to the reservoir, which is up on the hill, still up there. And I was looking after all that side of the story, like, you know, in Clover. It was quite an institution over there, 450 people working there in Clover. Like all that died then suddenly. That's a, a lot of, well, a lot of my story in relation to Waterford, you know. That's great. And what about, could you just talk a little bit about the, uh, the tramway train? Or... The tramway train was an institution in itself. They spoke about it yesterday, ducking onto it and so forth. We did the same ourselves many times. But who writes about it and speaks about it is Denny Cochran on the tramway train. And we used to be on bikes and race that tramway train out to, to, to tramway and beat it. She, ran, she went very slowly, you know, because she was what? She was about 30 or 40 foot long, and she used to go through Bat Street, the white gates in Bat Street, used to close, and she'd go through there and off out. And a ballon dud, she changed from one side of the road to the other side of the road, all the way out to tramway. How often we race it and beat it? She was very slow. We used to go out there to the... The pubs used to stay open longer in Tremor than Waterford. And all the crowd, a Sunday evening, the pubs were close here, all off Tremor. Now, another gang used to go to the GPO, had a club, a clubhouse here. But it was exclusive, you couldn't get into it unless you were a member. We used to go to Tremor and pay a penny on every drink out there more than water. There were two dance halls there. I forget the name of the second one. We used to go into the Atlantic, the first session. We used to run at that time was a football club, uh, South End. We used to run the whole thing. We a band there every Sunday. And there'd be a second session then from 11 on. 11 to 1. The train used to finish about half, half 12, I think. So if you couldn't get in on the, on the train, if you got to the second session, you had to get home by car or whatever it means. Like. We always went to the first session in the Atlantic and to some dance hall, beautiful dance hall. Then you'd always get the train home. Well, now we'd be at the first session, so we'd get the train home, obviously. The train used to be uh, one and threepence. I remember the time, the money, one and something to be that time. Oh my God, sing song. And to the way of life, actually. Not everyone in a congregate then in the, in the railway square and then the village all off home. No taxis that time, no such thing. But we used to have two hackneys, two pony and trap kind of sidecars. Like the one that was in uh, The Quiet Man. That type of Javi down there at the time. I said, no, that's all God's time now, mine. But also there's a story going, I don't know how true it is. The Tremor were very much against people in Waterford building out there. It was a closed shop, Tremor. You couldn't build out there for years until it all changed, I suppose, as time went on, you know? It was a kind of exclusive place, same as Dunmore. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be, didn't anybody would get a license uh, uh, to build a house out there type of thing, you know. The city was quiet. But that's some of my stories now about Waterford, as they, as they turned out, like, you know. I've had a charmed life, I suppose, in Waterford, to that extent, both ways. I ended up, anyway, Clover closed, I became a taxi man. I spent 20 years in the taxi. I drove every class, young and old, drove for the guards, Arkeen, the airport, drove to the airport every day of the week. Different people. When the airport went, when it opened first, they had very bad lights out there. I'm talking about 1963, 
64. Sorry, 83, 84. We had very bad lights in the airport. I didn't ever shoot, didn't ever plane that could land there like an you know, like a foggy day diverted the cock, diverted the Dublin, Shannon. And the people that would be coming off that plane waiting to go on the next flight. If they were businessmen. Ryanair guaranteed them they'd get there. So I drive them to Shannon or Dublin. Often we're hoping the plane, oh foggy day, we'll be going to Dublin Dublin today. Which we did many times. You know. Well, I drive the tomorrow to Dublin every other day, £25. Well, a day's pay, more or less. You wouldn't earn it, like, for example, on a taxi that same, all that day, like, you wouldn't earn it. Because to earn 25 you had to have 75 A third of what you know, tell the watch it earn, you get from the taxi man. But I enjoyed it. I had several events, for example, weddings. I drove all the boys in the city to weddings. I had a lovely time. So Tom, you're retired now? Retired now? Oh God, I, I would hope so. Yeah. What age are you? 85, last, on, last Friday. Had a very busy day. I'm supposed to rest every day now for, for an hour at my age. But when I get the time to rest, I don't know. I have five granddaughters. They're all wishing me well, of course. Text me, text me, text, text them back. I want to see, I'm on the phone all, all day, all day. Unbelievable as it happens. But like, it's, I suppose, my life was an open book that way. But enjoy the time I've had. Well, listen, thanks very much for time to get Not at all, I, I'm delighted. There's a few dockers alive now. Well, no, there's a, one in particular I wanted you to speak to now. I think you're a shy individual, if I, if I may say so now. Are we still on camera? Don't worry about it. Well, I reckon you're a shy individual, because I said to you, speak to Tom Cullen. Now, Tom Cullen is the father of, of Martin Cullen. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. And he was the stevedore of the time. He was in charge of the ship. 200 ton, 300 ton, 500 ton in the river. He'd make out a much tonnage. How many men are aboard our ship 24? And he knew how much to pay every man. And he knew all the facts and figures of the whole thing. And he's quite an able fellow. He's still alive like it all, and he's up there, up on uh, top of the town anyway. But he's a man you should speak to. Like, he could contradict things I might have said, for example, in reference to the docks or the quay or whatever. And I've said, like, Bare contradiction, like you know, I didn't know everything, like that kind of thing. No one could profess to, you know. But I pride myself in memory, for example. I remember a lot of things, you know, that stay in my memory. The one, for example, with the, with the, the, the 60 stone bags, that stayed in my memory forever, for one reason. It was a turning point with me on the docks. It wasn't a walk to slavery, which it was slavery. 16 stone away, carrying them on your shoulder. Now you have to go up as high as that with the, with, with the foot, 16 stone. It was a ton and pipe for me anyway. I'm about 21. 21, yeah. And over the floor over there. And look what happened. There was jobs going over there. And I got one. I never looked back. 23 years I spent over there.